Live and then record, right? Oh yeah, and clap. So go live and then start recording. Okay. Uh, oh, and then we go into PowerPoint. All right, everybody. That's convenient. I'm supposed to clap to make sure that the audio and vi video are aligned anyway, so I can pretend like it's part of the uh, thing. I mean, you can clap too, but that doesn't, it, it's great for me, but you know, for, for a lecture, not so much. All uh, right, well, welcome back, everybody. I'm so glad to see that I didn't scare you away uh, yet. But, uh, all right, well, good. Um, so welcome back to the second lecture of 6837. Uh, the way that 6837 is structured, the first lecture has basically no content. And then the second one has a ton of math. Um, so like the reality of this class is that it's kind of somewhere in between. <laughs> but we, uh, we give you the two extremes first just to, well, I don't know why, because that's the way the class is structured. And, 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 and that's what we'll be doing today. OK, so last time we had a nice overview of computer graphics discipline. And now we're going to dive right into the details and get started with, um, well, the actual content of the course. Before we do that, so I saw that many of you have already gotten started with your assignments, which is fabulous. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have downloaded Homework Zero? Managed to get something to compile? A few fewer. Uh, managed to add lines of code and compile the lines of code that you wrote? Finished. A few. This is great. OK. So that's actually better than average. I think having that extra section maybe was a, a useful thing. Um, so let's see, we, did that section already happen? It did. It was um, yesterday, I think? Yeah. 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 Excellent. And the materials are on the course website somewhere. Uh, there's one more review session. Zoe, our uh, faithful TA here, is, is going to uh, present a math overview, uh, I guess, on Monday of next week. So we're going to start using math. I'm sorry, like, unfortunately, we'll have a warped timeline because we're going to do math today, but officially you don't learn math until next Monday, but it's a, it's a review, so, so that's okay. Um, are there any other questions about procedural stuff before we get started with today's lecture? Nope. And Zoe, it's, uh, just to double check, the, does it look right on YouTube? <laughs> All right, excellent. So everybody remember, in class you are more than welcome to ask questions by putting it on the Slack or by just raising your hand, like the good old analog uh, version here. Okay, so today we're going to introduce Bezier curves and splines, mostly Bezier curves, and then we're going to continue next time by talking about splines, which is a really fun topic and a great way to get everybody confused about linear algebra. So that's my goal for today and uh, Thursday. So essentially, our uh, outline looks something like this. We're going to talk today about constructing just little segments of curves in two dimensions, really in one dimension, actually. And what we're going to see is that even though it feels like a geometry problem, it's actually going to end up looking closer to algebra. Now, if you come back and I haven't scared you too much in this course, you can come take my 6838 class and talk all about like differential geometry of curves and surfaces, and that's, that's fun stuff. In this class, we're not going to do that. We're going to just talk about the basic tools that artists and engineers use to design nice curvy shapes on a computer. Um, so today's plan is just the simple curve segments, and then next time, We'll talk about how to make long curves. And the way that we're going to do that is some kind of Frankenstein scenario. We're going to build a curve by gluing together different individual segments together in like a nice, smooth fashion. So that's our, our basic high-level uh, outline. Hopefully, you won't lose the forest through the trees as we write down a bunch of equations uh, and, and, and kind of just remember this, this high-level story. OK? Incidentally, I'm going to recruit everybody's help today. So because of our weird online scenario, in fact, there are apparently already sick people in this class who are not here, which is good, um, but they are watching on YouTube. What that means is that I need to stick to these two boards. <laughs> so we're gonna, there's like a bit of a combinatorial problem because there's a third board on the bottom, but if I use that, then I can't move it up. So I'm gonna rely on all of you to like yell at me <laughs> when I start writing on the third board or if I go to the other side. We're gonna, we're gonna try and do it here and you'll have to let me know if that's okay. Whew. Okay, so our basic motivation here looks something like this. So what we're going to learn in 6837 is it's really easy to draw basically two shapes, which is like a triangle and a line segment. We're going to talk all about different algorithms for drawing triangles. We're big on triangles around here. But unfortunately, those are very hard to use for like design purposes, right? Like if I opened up PowerPoint or Adobe Illustrator or something like that, 
And I designed like a cute, you know, swirling, curvy line thing, and now I want to edit it, like I want it to go through some other point. Well, if I design my curve using a bunch of little line segments, and I say, well, now I want it to go through this thing but stay smooth, that would be a problem, right? Because now I'd have a bunch of little itty bitty points that I have to displace. I think this is a pretty reasonable motivation that like this representation of a curve as a bunch of line segments is a totally reasonable one computationally. Like it's, it's, it's perfectly efficient. You can all come up with ways to store this. Like a long list of points seems like a pretty reasonable one. But from a high level perspective, it's not too useful. And so this is sort of our first example in graphics where there's the thing that we present to the end user, right? Like some nice high level description of a curve. And then there's the thing that's going on underneath the scenes, like a bunch of line segments. And then we're gonna need some kind of graceful machinery to link between those two. Right? And so that's sort of the art of, of all of this stuff. So in other words, what we're really looking for is some higher level representation of curves and surfaces that we can use for modeling on the one hand, but on the other hand, we can still generate those lower level primitives uh, like lines and triangles quite easily. Incidentally, this is a good vocabulary word to remember. Oftentimes computer graphics people use the word primitives. And what they mean by that are the sort of basic building block shapes that we use to make bigger stuff. Now, there's a bit of a like, you know, you know, where is the line kind of scenario? Like is a cylinder a primitive or is it only a triangle or whatever? I don't think that people use this in any formal fashion, but primitive is just like simple stuff. And then, I don't know, not primitive is, is not simple stuff. <laughs> okay, so there's many different options for how we can represent curves and surfaces. In this class, we're gonna talk about a few of the most common ones in graphics and computer-aided design. If you like this kind of stuff, you can take many different courses here at MIT that cover this in excruciating detail. So you can go over to the engineering department, learn about finite element methods and some of the uh, kind of surface representations those communities have in computer-aided design. Or you can take my geometry class or some of the computer vision courses here to really learn more detail about some of the, the computational application. So before we do that, one thing you might have noticed, I am a geometry professor. That's what I do when I'm not in the classroom teaching. So like, I love this kind of topic. And because of that, I'm like contractually obligated to like give you just a little bit of a taste of the kind of theory that goes into this stuff. Um, so, of course, when we talk about in curves and surfaces, the first thing we should figure out is like, what's our, our enemy here? Like, what, what are these objects that we're trying to represent? And really, I think that this perspective from calculus class is one that you all know and love, that essentially when we say the word curve, what we really mean is a geometric object that, if you zoom in close enough, kind of looks like a line. And the surface is something that, if you zoom in close enough, looks like a plane. Incidentally, does anybody know the kind of general math term for like a thing that you zoom in close enough and it looks like a flat space? Yes, in the back. Riemann surface is uh, one slight generalization of this. I think the more common term is something called a manifold. Um, and, and so, of course, if you take a lot of geometry classes in our math department, then a manifold is something that locally looks like Euclidean space for some dimension. But a Riemann surface is a nice example too. Those are, uh, have some complex analysis structure attached to them. Right, so in general, whether you're working on manifolds, curves, surfaces, whatever your favorite term is, then the reason why geometry is a little bit tricky is that dimensionality becomes something that really needs a little bit of a qualifier, right? So for instance, here I'm drawing you a curve in the plane, right? This is a, a black curve sitting on the, the plane of our computer screen. And there's a totally sensible question, which is, is this a two-dimensional object or a one-dimensional object? And the answer is sort of both, right? So the curve is sitting on the 2D plane, and it's not just a straight line. So there is a 2D structure here. But the word that we often use is this is intrinsically a one-dimensional object. So in other words, like if I'm an ant crawling along this curve, then it like kind of looks like 1D space locally as I move around, right? And we see that play out mathematically. So essentially, the way that we're gonna parametrize curves in this class is by functions of just like one variable, right? And you can think of that variable like time, right? So I have a little car that's like driving along my curve and I look at the exhaust pipe, I'm pointing in a funny, and if you look at the exhaust coming out of the back of the car, I'll, I'll let you fill in what that means for me as I walk around the classroom. And of course that object geometrically is gonna be the curve that we're, we're tracing out on the, on the plane, yeah? Okay. so. In 6837, we're going to focus on the most common type of high-level uh, geometric description in the computer graphics world, and this is something called parametric geometry. The reason it's called parametric geometry is that there's a parameter. So when I think of a curve, 
for example, I'm going to think of it as gamma of t. Right? Use the letter t because it's like kind of suggestive of time. Right? So time is like the time as you drive along the surface, and then the thing it traces out is the curve itself. If I wanted my uh, thing to be a surface rather than a curve, then I would be a function of two parameters, u and v. Right? So this would be like moving along these two different uh, sort of grid directions that you see on the surface here. Does that make sense? I'll pause for a second. Notice that this is essentially exposing the intrinsic dimensionality. It's like your, your Star Trek phrase for the day of the, of, the, of the surface, yeah? Because that t, there's only one t, so it's a curve. And there's two parameters, u and v, so the second guy is the surface, right? Now, if you want to be really tricky, just because a function is a function of two variables doesn't make it a surface. So for example, beta of uv identically equals 0 gives you a point. So there are some conditions that you need to check, but we'll come back to that later. OK, so let's do an example. How would I parameterize a line? Like, how would I make gamma of t for, for a line? Does anybody have any idea? Like, what, what kind of function? Yes? I would use, like, if I wanted to represent both dimensions at the same time, I'd use a vector plus mm -hmm. uh, some, our parameter t times a different vector. And the first vector would kind of be our support, mm -hmm. and the other vector would be the direction. That sounds like a good idea. So let me, let me draw a picture, and we'll see. Uh, if I can replicate. So what our colleague suggests, Max, Maxine, no, that's, that's you. No, that's George. George, what George suggests, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, we have two students who said they're from Europe in the front row, it's very confusing. Um, so we have some point on our, our, our curve here, we'll call that gamma naught, right? And this is just some arbitrary location on our line. And then uh, what George uh, suggests is absolutely right, is to draw a vector pointing along our curve. So maybe like, that. That was supposed to be parallel, but I did a bad job. Uh, then we can call that maybe D for direction. Then a reasonable parameterization of my curve is going to be what? Gamma of T is equal to gamma naught plus T times the direction, right? So obviously as I change T, essentially I'm kind of rescaling this vector here and I'm getting different points along the line. I'm also standing in front of the equation, so you can't actually read it. There you go. <laughs> OK, so indeed, I think that's a totally sensible parameterization of a line. Just one thing to double check here for, for sanity purposes. Let's say that I give you a pair of like two gamma zeros and two d's. Do those necessarily make different lines? No, right? Like I could have chosen gamma zero to be like this point here and had the same line, for example. And this is going to be something that's going to come back and bother us quite a bit when we talk about parametric geometry, that like, there's going to be a lot of different parameter kind of formulas here that are going to correspond to the same object geometrically, which is a bit annoying to, to work with. It's also kind of a clue that like, we're translating geometry to algebra, but like the, the correspondence isn't one to one. We're kind of doing this for convenience, but it's not perfect mathematically. Uh, let's do a second exercise. Let's say I want to parameterize a circle. How could I do that? Any ideas? Yes. Oh, uh, well, it's really a point. I, I, I don't know. Depending on what class you took, maybe you put a... What do we like for points? I have no political preference. No political preference. <laughs> that's, that's good. It's, it's, it's good to remain neutral on these things. Actually, uh, you know, we're all, we're all grown-ups here. I'm just going to remove it altogether. <laughs> there you go. Okay. I remember there was, like, a big moment in, in an analysis class I took in college when the professor stopped writing a little hat on the vectors and said, like, you know, you've made it far enough. <laughs> And it really, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it was like a pat in the back, kind of like, it really stuck with me. Okay, so, so that's a line. <laughs> How can I draw a circle? Yes, in the back. Sine and cosine, that's right. So if I wanted to draw a circle, right, then I have gamma of t equals maybe sine of t, cosine of t. Totally sensible. One thing to note is that this is not a polynomial. The rest of our lecture today, we're going to talk about mostly cubic polynomials. And in fact, you can't draw a circle using those kinds of graphics tools. And that's actually kind of reasonable. If you take that like spline tool in PowerPoint and you try to draw a perfect circle, you'll see it's actually quite challenging. <laughs> um, not impossible, I think, because they use um, rational curves, but, but, but annoying. OK, so indeed, there's our, our circle. In case you forgot what it looks like, I've, I've conveniently illustrated it for you on the slide. 
So one thing to note is that this is not the only representation of geometry that people use in computer graphics. Just out of curiosity, can anybody give me a different way I might represent a shape? Yeah. As a collection of points, yep. So oftentimes graphics people call that a point cloud. Any other ideas? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So that would be called an implicit model. <laughs> so a different thing that you could do, for example, if I wanted to draw a curve, come up with some function on the entire plane, and then say like the zero level set is the curve I care about. That's what our colleague is calling a constraint. And yep, that's a totally sensible way to represent a shape. So there are a lot of different representations out there. We're going to focus on parametric geometry today. Some of these other representations will come back later. So for example, in fluid simulation, this kind of implicit modeling turns out to be quite useful. And, and oftentimes what they'll do is like represent the function f on a grid, and then the fluid is kind of moving along the grid. Uh, but that, that's a, a bit of a, an advanced topic. OK, so our goal for today and for next time, because I'm moving slowly, I'm bad at managing course time, especially after having not taught for a year and a half, um, is essentially we want to learn how to model a smooth curve. Now, the word smooth in computer graphics I think is used in a bit more fuzzy way than we typically use the word smooth in like calculus class. For us, smooth is usually like differentiable or differentiable up to some number of derivatives. So we're going to formalize that in our next lecture. For today, it'll actually be infinitely differentiable, but like in a boring way because cubic stuff like only has so many derivatives. Yep. Um, and essentially, there are a lot of different considerations that go into the ways that we model curves, right? On the one hand, we want them to be kind of easy to edit from a high level. That's going to be important for our artists. We want to be able to convert them to some low-level representation like a polyline. And then eventually, something we're going to keep in the back of our mind is that we're going to also use basically the same things we developed for curves to model 3D surfaces by kind of taking a curve and sweeping it along another curve. And we'll talk more about that next time. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a really great question. Yeah, sorry, I forgot your name. Ari. Ari. So, so Ari asked a really fabulous question. So in some graphics tools, I draw a curve, and I zoom in really close. Like maybe that curve even has like some nice like chalky texture to it or something. And I zoom in really close, and I start to see pixels, right? I, I see little square blobs. And then other things like PowerPoint and Illustrator, I can keep zooming in, like, like what's on the screen here, and it just continues to look smooth, right? And those actually are sort of the two different approaches to computer graphics uh, in some sense, right? There's raster graphics and there's vector graphics. So here we're definitely talking about vector graphics, meaning that when we talk about what's on the screen here, we're not just storing like one color per pixel, we're actually storing a description of this curve. Whereas in raster graphics, we just have a big grid of pixel colors, like in MS Paint. So raster graphics, if I zoom in, I'm going to see the resolution of the image, right? It's just like whatever I drew. Vector graphics, I can zoom in and see what I want because I just have some formula for the curve. On the other hand, you know, some of these representations can be more or less unwieldy depending on, on what kind of graphics you're doing. Fabulous question. Anything else? All right. So curves show up all over the place in computer graphics domain. I think the two places, one, as, as Ari suggests, is in vector graphics tools. So here I show you, a, I think this is a, a screenshot of Inkscape, the sort of open source version of, of Illustrator. A different place that curves are going to show up in our discussion in 6837 is in, in animation, right? So now the curve is not just you know, in space, but actually kind of in time, right? And that's sort of tracing out the path that some object follows. Now, modern software demands all kinds of crazy things of its geometric representations. In fact, the curves that we'll talk about today are pretty much the ones that are used to design fonts and what, what's stored on your computer here. Um, but really, the applications of this stuff go, go pretty far. I mean, it's really not all that surprising that these basic geometric objects are the ones that, that, that we're using every day in our, our, our modeling tools. Okay, so we're like slowly making our picture more detailed and we're missing one more kind of thing I mentioned that we want to be able to convert things into a simpler representation. The procedure that we're going to do uh, that with, let me try that again. The procedure with which we will make a curve into a set of simpler objects like, like little line segments 
is something called tessellation. Tessellation in this class is going to refer to like not like some crazy MC Escher kind of thing, but rather just like the idea that I can take some complicated curve, sample a bunch of points on it, connect them with line segments, and that is some reasonable representation of my geometry. Right? So the basic inspiration here is that it's, we can just write a piece of code that rasterizes uh, line segments, rasterization being the procedure of converting vector graphics into what's going on on the, the image grid. Because right? at the end of the day, your screen is composed of pixels. Um, and that sort of rasterizing line segments is good enough so long as we have a way of converting our general curves into a bunch of line segments, right? And so that procedure is called rasterization. I feel like that was a very roundabout, like, five sentence, but hopefully you guys got the, the picture there. Um, so in order to do that with parametric geometry, it's quite easy, right? You just have a bunch of t values, you, you evaluate your function a bunch of times, and, and you're good. And what you end up with is this thing that we're going to call a polyline exactly what it sounds like. It's just a bunch of lines connected together, line segments, really. Now, the pros of this uh, geometric representation are that they're easy to store in a computer, just a bunch of coordinates. They're easy enough to render by just chopping them up into a bunch of line segments. Or, in fact, they already are line segments, I'm sorry. Um, but they're not smooth and they're hard to edit. Yeah, I think we've already talked about that. And in order to convert a general curve into this by tessellating, we just sample a bunch of t's, and, and that gives us like our dotted line approximation here. Now, what would I do if my resolution wasn't high enough? I didn't capture the interesting features in my curve. Yeah. Add more points. Yeah, just draw more t's, right? So as I draw more t's, I get a better approximation. Now, there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem here if you wanted to do this automatically. Um, this is actually kind of challenging. I'll let you guys think about this at home. Like, if I have some smooth function gamma of t, like, what t values should I choose to get the best approximation? Well, in some sense, if I knew that, <laughs> uh, you, you know, you can see, like, where, where this, this becomes circular, right? Like, I only know the right t values by trying a bunch of t values. But once I've done that, I've spent the computation I needed to, to sample in my curve, right? Um, so there's a bunch of strategies out there. They tend to be called, like, adaptive sampling. Or what they'll do is they'll say, like, oh, it kind of looks like there's a bunch of curvature over here, so maybe I should add some more t's or something like that. You guys could probably all cook up some kind of reasonable strategies at home. OK. So that's our low-level curve representation, right? It's a polyline, but it's not a good high-level one. And so from the perspective of making a high-level curve representation, somehow there's like a push-pull between a few different demands, right? We'd like to be expressive in the sense that it would be annoying if I had a PowerPoint curve for drawing curves, a PowerPoint tool for drawing curves, and the only thing it knew how to do was draw a circle. Right, because like I probably want to draw lines sometimes. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, I'd like it to be you know simple enough that I can capture most things that I might want to draw on the computer. Now, of course, there are a few kind of you know I could push this to the, the far extremes and 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 get some impractical kind of limits. So, for example, I'm never going to find a representation of all possible curves on a computer because we have a finite number of bits. <laughs> um, and moreover, you know, polylines, which are sort of the simplest possible representation, right? They only know how to draw line segments, but you're going to need a lot of line segments in order to approximate any given shape. OK, so we're going to talk about a slightly different compromise along that scale, and that's talking about splines. How many of us have heard of splines? Like, you know, in SimCity, which I'm realizing is about 25 years out of date, you know, it says like reticulating splines when you start that video game. If you're wondering, that means nothing. Um, and a spline is a particular kind of choice of a smooth curve in two and three dimensions that's really popular in computer graphics. Um, anybody know where the term spline comes from, by the way? It comes from shipbuilding. Well, actually, we'll talk about that. I think I have a picture of it in the next lecture. Right, so essentially the way that splines are going to work is that we're going to sort of define a very simplistic like, class of little curvy shapes that we're going to draw today. And then we're going to link them together into networks to make more complicated things like this letter F. And they really are the, the objects that are used in like 2D illustration and storing fonts. So for example, PostScript and TrueType are two major font formats that use uh, spline curves underneath the hood. And also in 3D modeling as sort of swept surface objects. OK, so the basic principles of drawing spline curves are, are written here. Essentially, a spline curve is going to be consisted of a bunch of points that we'll call control points which are maybe points, not necessarily on the curve, but points that are going to control the geometry of the curve. 
So in this case, the four control points really are on the curve, but that doesn't have to be the case. We'll see some examples later. And then essentially what's going to happen is that given these four points, we're going to just come up with functions like x of t, y of t, and z of t that are kind of written in terms of these four points and have a piece of geometry related to them. Okay, so typically the way that splines are going to work is that we're going to cook up x, y, and z to be piecewise polynomial, meaning that it's like a little like cubic piece glued onto another little cubic piece and so on. So today we're going to talk about just one of those. Basically, we're going to just talk about cubic functions for the rest of today's lecture, which I know is like everybody's favorite. And then next time we're going to talk about how to glue them together in a really elegant way. Okay, so that's our, our plan of attack, right? We're going to do simple 1D functions, and then we're going to lift to like 2D things, right? So here it's like t and f of t. Here we're going to have x of t and y of t. So notice that this picture does not include time, right? This is like tracing it out. It's the exhaust pipe. And then finally, we're going to talk about how to glue these things together. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm like talking in circles a little bit today. I'm sorry, I haven't had enough coffee. Excellent. And of course, the real inspiration here is that we can't really, you know, have any reasonable uh, uh, computational representation of all possible curves, because this is like an, an infinite dimensional space, right? Infinite dimensional things we can't do on computers. And so we need to move to some finite dimensional space we can work with. And so a very typical thing to do when we talk about constructing curves and, and really just constructing functions. So you see that like gamma of t is just like a function from t to a number. We're just drawing it like a curve. A very typical way to make this sort of more feasible computationally is not to work in this like giant ill-defined space, but rather to work in a set of basis functions. So hopefully all of us have heard the term basis in linear algebra class. Okay, we see some nods, a few eye rolls, good. This is the typical and applause, man, what a day. Um, right, so the basic idea here is that I'm not gonna think about every possible function gamma of t. I'm only going to think about functions gamma of t that I can write as some linear combination of a set of functions phi sub i. So here, when I wanna represent a curve, the way that I'm gonna do it is by storing that list like a1, a2, a3, a4, dot, 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 you know, however many a's there are. And I'm going to think of these functions phi as just some preset set of functions phi t that are somehow useful, <laughs> right? So let's do an example. Actually, does anybody have a suggestion? Like, like, what's a good set of basis functions? Actually, that's a leading question because that's the kind of thing that like the math kids are going to answer because they've seen it before. Okay, so, so here's a reasonable set. Um, oh, wait. So... How many, how many of us have heard of Taylor series? Cool. So Taylor series roughly approximate like all functions that we care about. That's completely false if you're in math, but they, they approximate a lot of things. If you're a physicist, then that's, that's more or less true. So what would be a reasonable basis that I could use for representing Taylor series? Like what are Taylor series? Uh, how about somebody I haven't heard from like in the, in the red here? The monomials, that's a great idea. So here's a basis. So maybe I make phi zero of t to be just identically equal to one. I make phi one of t to be equal to t. Phi two of t equals t squared. Phi three of t. Any guesses? Thank you. I'm teaching in a classroom again. I get to like try and engage you people. That's right. So this would be called the monomial basis, right? And now, if I wanted to really represent Taylor series, I need to have infinitely many of them. If I wanted to do just like degree three polynomials, then how many of them would I need? Trick question. Degree three? Four. That's right. Your instructor's going to get that wrong. I'm going to say three a bunch of times, and I'm going to mean four. <laughs> okay. And indeed, that's like sort of the most obvious basis. And notice that it's like a restricted basis. If I just have like finitely many phi's, I can no longer represent every possible curve. I can only represent the set of degree three polynomials. But that's a lot of curves. So that's a good start. Okay? So if I wanted to represent a degree three polynomial, what could I do? So for example, let's say I have f of t, like on the, the screen here, is one minus t plus t squared. Well, if I know that I'm working in the space of degree three things, then I could just kind of keep a vector, which is the coefficient. So in this case, one 
minus t uh, plus t, oh, oh no, I got it wrong. One minus t, so the coefficient is minus one, plus t squared plus zero t cubed. Right, so notice that in essence, I'm taking things that look like functions, and I'm not writing them kind of like vectors because I've chosen a basis. Now we're used to basis being vectors, right? That's what you think of in like beginning linear algebra class. Here our basis is a set of functions phi t. Does everybody understand how I got to the, from the function f of t on the screen to this vector here on the board? Thumbs up, thank you. That's right, so here's our, our linear algebra perspective. Essentially, we've chosen some basis, so I'm sorry, I did the, the quadratic polynomials on the, the screen and the cubic ones on the board here. But if I did the quadratic monomial basis, like on the screen, then my basis is 1t and t squared. So if I have a function, then I can write it as a linear combination of these phi's, and then I can store the coefficients in our vector here. In fact, if I have a collection of functions, because remember that like I'm going to want to trace out a curve as like x of t, y of t, something like that. Well, here's one way that I could do it. So let's say that I have like four functions. So I'm in x, y, z, w space, which is actually gonna matter quite a bit in this course. Then I could write the functions on the left-hand side and I could kind of factor them as a matrix vector product. Do you see that? So here, my vector is containing my basis for functions. And then the matrix is containing the coefficients. So for example, remember how matrix vector multiplication works, right? It goes left to right on the first one, top down, second. Actually, you're all looking at me. So it's, it's left to right there and top down like that. So for example, in the second row here, I have one times one plus one times t squared plus zero, zero, which is one plus t. Okay. Notice what we're doing. We're taking like functions, which are annoying to work with, and we're like converting that into like matrices, which are much easier to work with. Yeah, that's our, our, our task. Are we done? Like, let's say that I want to work with cubic functions. I mean, you could ask a question, which is like, okay, so, Great, now we have linear algebra language, like we can represent cubics if, you know, Justin, you said at the beginning of the lecture, our goal was to talk about cubic curves, like, like let's go home. And that is a reasonable <laughs> thing to want to do. Indeed, your instructor is already very tired of, of teaching in this mask. But it turns out that this is not a very useful basis for most graphics tasks. Remember what we do in linear algebra class, right? We talk about matrices and vectors, and then we start talking about change of basis. Now we're gonna take these ideas of change of basis and see what they sort of mean in this context. In particular, what we're gonna see is that monomial basis is like hella annoying for doing most graphics things, okay? So for example, let's say I wanna solve the interpolation problem, <laughs> right? So I have like two different t values and two different like f of t values and I want the straight line that goes in between them. Now quickly, if I told you that I have t1 and t2 and f of t1 and f of t2, what would be the vector of two values that gives me that line? It's actually not so obvious. I mean, like you could work it out on pen and paper, but like all this is to say is that like finding A and B here for the line that goes through two points is actually like requires some computation. But that's like a really obvious task that we want to do in graphics, like interpolate two things. And already we're having to do like adds and multiplies and divides and stuff. In fact, it only gets worse. So like, let's say I have a quadratic curve and I want to fit it to like three points. This is like not a super useful basis for that. Moreover, there's kind of a weird thing that happened, right? Like if I was thinking of this like a graphics tool, or like put on your graphics hat, take off your, your like college math hat for a second. Like let's say that you're an artist and you specify those three red points. Now this is the, the parabola that goes through them. I can tell you I really struggled in PowerPoint to draw something that was actually a parabola. What's the problem? Well, like the most interesting part of the screen curve is probably the peak. But nothing about those three points that I drew would indicate that I would want that peak there. This is actually like kind of a frustrating representation to work with for, for curves. You guys get that? So polynomials are useful. We're going to do a lot of polynomials in this class with the kind of obvious thing of A, working with monomials, and B, just interpolating between data. Both of those start to fall apart in this, this particular setting. So we need something a little better. And in particular, we're going to introduce a tool that you've probably all seen in like Illustrator, PowerPoint, whatever. Those are my go-to examples today. Later, we're going to like move on to other graphics tools, uh, which is a user interface that looks something like what I've shown you on the screen here. How many of you guys have seen a UI that kind of looks like this? Yeah, most of you. If you haven't, then like pull out your laptop and open up your favorite drawing tool, and, and you'll, you'll find it, right? 
Or essentially, what I want is a curve segment that goes through two points and has two prescribed tangents. OK? And today, we're going to continue to just use polynomial functions to represent these kinds of things. I'm going to see that there's a really clever basis that makes this kind of computation easy. Why do I say that? Well, I could do this with a monomial basis, but I'd have to do a lot of algebra to figure out like what is the curve that has these two points and these two tangents. And the whole goal in computer graphics is to do these computations really, really fast and in a nice, clean way. We haven't done that yet. So first of all, I've specified four pieces of information, right? I've specified two different values for my function and two different tangents. So what degree polynomial do I need to be able to capture all that information? I've got four degrees of freedom. I see, I see there's some disagreement. I see threes, fours, and fives and, and like weird hand gestures going on. So the answer is degree three, right? Because take a look. So here is the cubic monomial basis. Notice that there's four of them. Everybody gets this wrong because of that, that constant function, uh, uh, one here. Right? So there's four kind of basis functions to work with, and we have four pieces of information. So those, those two things kind of fit together. And that's what we're going to do today. So in particular, we have these four pieces of information. We want a polynomial. We're going to call that f of t, where I have like two different, t, you know, two different points in time, t0 and t1, where I specify both the value and the tangent. My goal is to find a, a cubic function that has those two properties. Does that make sense to everybody, what our, our goal is here? I appreciate you guys nodding. This is the kind of thing that we didn't get to do on Zoom. I'm still not over this. I'm going to talk, like, there's going to be a lot of meta conversation about how excited I am to be in a classroom. Um, now, for convenience, I'm going to take t0 to be 0 and t1 to be 1. That's actually fine from a graphics perspective because the t is irrelevant to how we draw stuff on the screen. Right? Like, if I rescale t, that actually doesn't affect what gets drawn. Um, yeah. So, in particular, we have this kind of picture here. Okay? So, what are we going to do? Let's actually do this calculation on the board. Ugh. Oh no, I erased my monomials. That's okay. Oh, every year I mean to swap out A, B, C, and D for something better, but I forgot. So, I want a cubic polynomial, and I essentially have four different unknowns to specify a cubic polynomial. A, B, C, and D. In the monomial basis. That's the tag we're going to use a lot today. Right? So, I can write my monomial. P of T is equal to A, T cubed plus B t squared plus c t plus d. We could all compute the derivative, I hope, of, of this curve, right? So this is going to be p prime of t. Watch, your instructor has a math degree. I'm going to do it without looking at the screen. You can tell me if I'm right. This is 3 a t squared plus 2 b t plus c. Yes. OK. Thank you, guys. OK, so, so remember, we've got four pieces of information. We have p of 0, p of 1, p prime of 0, and p prime of 1. So let's actually plug in t equals 0 and t equals 1 and uh, see what we get. So p of 0. Any ideas? On 3. 1, 2, 3. D. D. Thank you. p of 1. 1, 2, 3. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, a plus b plus c plus d, like that. We have p prime of 0. This is going to be c. p prime of 1. Mumble, mumble, mumble. 3a plus 2b plus c. Cool? All right. So. The good news is that all of our math is always duplicated on the slides in case you can't read my horrible handwriting here. Yes? I'm sorry, there was a sneeze that happened right when you asked your question. <laughs> One more time. Why does it need to be cubic? That's a great question. Um, this is an engineering decision. I could have had a quintic polynomial, for example, but then I would kind of have more degrees of freedom than information. Do you see that? Like, I know four things. I know p of 0, p of 1, p prime of 0, p prime of 1. So I strategically chose it to be cubic because there are four unknowns, a, b, c, and d. So there's sort of a hope that I can find these four things and that they're uniquely determined by the information I put in. Ah, that's a good question. Can it be a parabola? The answer is no, right? Because now if I have three pieces of information, like p of 0, p of 1, and p prime of 0, 
I've completely determined my, pro my parabola, so I don't get control over p prime of 1 anymore. We'll keep thinking about it. But for now, we're going to work with, with cubics. But essentially, the, the point here is that you have four things coming in, so you want four things coming out. right? And, and a parabola would only have three numbers that can come out. And so there's not quite enough kind of degrees of freedom to work with. Notice, in, in fact, I think once you see our calculation, you'll see how that, that kind of plays out. OK, so we're going to give these things names, because that's the information that goes in. We'll call these h0, h1, h2, and h3. Yes? Mm hmm That's right. Okay, got it. Okay, yeah, excellent. Okay, so, so these are the four pieces of information that we have. Does anybody kind of, like, if I forgot the top half of this slide, the bottom half should look awful lot like something that you all have developed sledgehammers for dealing with in your linear algebra class, right? This is a linear system of equations. Right? Right. Uh, in fact, <laughs> so here I, I copied what's on the board onto our screen. I'm not going to bother writing all this onto this, the board because my hand hurts. Um, essentially, all I've done is taken these four relationships and written them in nice, slick matrix notation. What do you think I'm going to do? This is like screaming out. We should take that matrix and invert it, right? And when I do that, you can all open up MATLAB and see if you agree with me <laughs> what I'm going to get is the following, right? So this is a way to determine H0, H1, H2, and H3 from the A, B, C, and D. That's not actually what I wanted, right? Remember the input data here was like the values and the tangents. And so this is a way to get me A, B, and C, and D from the data that I actually have on hand, like what the person actually drew on the computer screen. I'm looking at OBS right now, and I'm realizing that I put the slides on the wrong side of the screen, so I'm like pointing at yeah, whatever. Um, does that make sense? So this is a way to get the monomial coefficients of your curve given that input data. OK. So now we can do kind of a slick thing. And it looks a little something like this. I'm having fun writing on the board. This is great. So remember that our curve was p of t is equal to a t cubed plus b t squared plus c t plus d. And now I can look at this expression and I can take our formula for p of t and make it a heck of a lot worse. <laughs> In particular, can somebody give me an expression for a in terms of the h's? Here, can you, can you help me out? That's right, minus 2h1 plus h2 plus h t2. You guys see that? So what I did is I just read off the first row of this matrix, right? And then similarly, we're going to have, I'll just copy it like this, 3 minus 2 minus 1. And then we have just a, a plus h2 t plus h0. So this is OK. <laughs> does that you agree with me? What I did is I took our expressions for a, b, c, and d, and I plugged them in here. And now what I'm going to do is regroup. OK, so like currently, this is in terms of the t's, right? That's what's kind of on the outside. Now let's factor out the h's. OK, so what am I going to get? So for example, what's next to h naught? Well, I have a 2t cubed. And then I have a minus 3t squared. And then let's see, is there anything else for the h naught? Yeah, plus 1. All right. Now, <laughs> I'm going to let you guys do that at home. What I did was essentially, we're going to pull the h's to the outsides and the t's to the inside. Do you guys see the spiritually what I did, even if I'm too lazy to write the other four parts? Well, presto change it. I did it on the screen here. Okay? So <laughs> we started with our expression for p. 
we plugged in our formulas for A, B, C, and D in terms of the H's, and then we regrouped to pull the H's out and move the T's in. So these four functions of T have a fancy name. These are called the Ermit basis, and I've plotted them here. <laughs> Okay, so again, remember this, this formula down here with these boxes is our formula for P of T. And so it's, it's H naught times this first cubic polynomial, H1 times the second, H2 times the third, H3 times the third, fourth, whatever. And now let's like kind of bond with these four functions on the screen for just a second. So first of all, let's look at H naught. What is the value of H naught at T equals zero? One. What's the value of H naught at T equals one? Zero, yeah. What's the value of the derivative of h naught at time zero? What's the value of derivative of h naught at time what? Also zero, right? Notice that it's flat. It goes down and then it flattens out again. It's like an S shape, but split. So what is h naught? It is the function that is one at t equals zero, zero t equals one, and both of its derivatives are equal to zero, right? So when I scale that by h0, notice that the derivatives are getting zeroed out at time 0 and time 1. Essentially, h0 is just controlling the value at, at time 0. Right? And similarly, like when I look at the second Hermit polynomial, it's kind of flipped version of h0. It's 1 at time 1, 0 at time 0, and the derivatives are 0. So it's really just controlling the value at time 1 without affecting the derivatives at time 0 or time 1, and so on. Does that make sense? So, in other words, I can actually write a really slick representation for a cubic polynomial. Do you guys see what I did here? So any cubic polynomial, P of t, can be written as the cubic polynomial evaluated at 0 times the 0 with uh, Hermit basis function plus P of 1 times the first one plus P of prime of 0 times the second and so on. Does this expression make sense to you guys? Now, notice that we now have two different bases for the set of cubic functions, right? One of them is the monomial basis, that's what we started with, and the other is this new basis, this, this Hermit basis, which is like a mix and match version of the, the, the cubic ones. So I can take any cubic polynomial and I can write it in either of these two bases, that's perfectly fine, but the reason that I might wanna work with the Hermit basis is that, for example, if I wanna solve the problem, give me the cubic polynomial through these two points with these two derivatives, well, that's just a formula in the Hermit basis, but it like requires a bunch of calculation in the monomial one. Does that make sense? So graphics people, even though we're working with cubic polynomials, you hear this phrase all the time, like blah, 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 cubic polynomial, blah, blah, blah. I feel like you've heard that from me a bunch. The reality is that we're not working in monomials. We're working with like other ways to represent cubic stuff on a computer. Okay, so this is all uh, just for representing functions of, of one variable that go into one dimension. Yeah, the uh, question? Mm -hmm. That's right. So if, if I want to actually evaluate this thing, somehow it feels like this is more work computationally in terms of adds and multiplies. That's only actually marginally true. I don't have to compute t cubed four times for the four different functions. I can compute it once, compute, evaluate the h's, and then evaluate my expression. It's actually not clear from adds and multiply perspective what the, the most efficient thing is. Yeah. Okay, so we now have two different ways to represent a function of one variable. If we want to make a curve, then what do I do? Well, then I'll just make like the x coordinate a cubic and the y coordinate a different cubic. Does that make sense? So in that case, if I compute the first derivative, what I get is the tangent vector to my curve. I think this is kind of familiar from like calculus class. And so this is the kind of picture that we draw. Notice this is a little misleading because like this looks an awful lot like what we were drawing like here. But actually, the pictures are not the same, right? This is like a curve on the plane. The other was like the x-axis was time and the y-axis was value. Here, everything is value and there is no time. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay. And to kind of drive that point home, I think the, the really key thing to remember in a picture like what I'm drawing you on the slide here is that you don't see t in this picture, right? This is only x and y. And this is like tracing out the curve along the plane, right? We've forgotten time. In fact, 
there are multiple ways of drawing the same curve, even just like in the cubic basis. So for instance, here I've given you two different functions, f1 of t and f2 of t, which both just trace out the line y equals 2x. Do you see that? But what's the difference is sort of the speed of the car as it drives along that curve, right? So in the first one, the car is driving with constant speed. The second one, the, curve, the car kind of grinds to a halt at the origin and then keeps going. Does that make sense? If you're in like differential geometry class in the math department, this is like a kind of thing because you're like trying to apply calculus but like to geometry and somehow like there's a difference, right? Like it's, it's, it's different calculus but the same geometry and there's like you need to do some work to account for that. Okay, so in the remainder of our lecture today, we're going to introduce one more basis for cubic curves. You thought like we've done everything we could possibly do with cubic functions. You would be wrong. And this is going to be an elegant way to sample points on cubic curves. In fact, this goes back to uh, Maxine's question here. I hope, Maxine, you're good. Yes. Um, which is essentially like somehow computationally, this Hermit basis like seems to require more multiplies and adds than the other one. So now we're going to introduce a third basis called the Bernstein basis for polynomials, not to be confused with the, the bears, which apparently is not Bernstein, right? Um, uh, which is going to be, give us a really elegant and efficient way to get points at t's that are between 0 and 1. This is like, like, you know, like a top 10, like Justin's favorite algorithms list. This is like definitely in the top like 1 or 2. Okay, it's like, this is so cool. So I'm going to need you all to like stick with me and the second that I say something you don't understand, you stop me because this is a cool algorithm and I want you to get it. Okay. So, in order to do that, we need to take a quick detour into algebraic geometry, everybody's favorite area of math. Um, in particular, we're going to define something called a cubic blossom, which I think is such an artful math term. <sighs> now, a cubic blossom is a thing that I can construct for any cubic polynomial function. So, the convention that we're going to take in 6837 is we're going to think of a function as like little f and its blossom as big F, right? That's going to be the convention. Now, if you're doing a cubic blossom, then the cubic polynomial is just a function of one variable t, and the blossom is going to be the function of three variables t1, t2, and t3. Okay? And essentially, the blossom is going to be defined by three properties that I've written for you on the screen. Now, the cubic blossom of a polynomial is going to be symmetric, meaning that I can flip any of the t's and not affect the value. It's going to be affine, meaning that I can kind of draw a line in the first argument. And that's the same as kind of pulling the coefficients out to the outside. This is called the affine property. Notice that this is a slightly weaker property than being linear. And then, or weaker, stronger, stronger. Um, and then we have a third thing, which is the thing that actually links big F and little f, which is going to be the property that we'll call the diagonal property, which says if I put in the same little t three times, I get back my original cubic. Now, this feels very abstract, and that's because it is. <laughs> but we're going to see that it's actually very mechanical to compute the cubic blossom given a given uh, cubic polynomial. And then moreover, given any function that satisfies these three properties, it's easy to see that it, when I put it in t three times, I get back a cubic. So like this is kind of in correspondence with one another. OK, so first of all, ugh. Can anybody give me the cubic blossom for the following cubic polynomial, which is f of t is identically equal to 1? What would be a good cubic blossom for this one? I'll give you a hint. Try like basically the only thing you can think of. Yes. Yeah. So big F of t1, t2, t3 equals 1. <laughs> Notice that it's symmetric. If I flip any of the t's, I get the same value. Yeah? It's affine because the right-hand side isn't affected by what goes into the argument. And uh, it's diagonal because when I put in t three times, I get back 1. <laughs> okay? Yes? Uh, can you plot this for every cubic polynomial? Yes, we're going to construct how to do that. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to do it for 1 t, t squared, and t cubed. And then you can get a blossom for anyone by just linearly combining them. Yeah. So, f of t equals t. So, this one's a little bit trickier. 
Anybody have an idea how I could construct the cubic blossom in the back there? Yeah? That's a great idea. So, one third of T1 plus T2 plus T3. Now, let's think about how our colleague came up with this clever formula, right? So, first of all, notice that it's kind of symmetric in the sense that, like, the role of the three T's pretty much looks the same here. Moreover, what if I put in T three times? Well, I have T1 plus T2 plus T3, so that's just T plus T plus T divided by three, so I get T back. And moreover, it's affine, which basically, you know, is, is, is kind of like saying it, it kind of looks linear plus a constant here. Make sense? All right, let's do the annoying one. F of T equals T squared. So what's going to be big F of T1, T2, T3? Think about kind of extending the strategy that we already have here. Somebody new? Anybody have an idea that I haven't heard from yet? Or somebody else, that's cool too. Yeah? Sure. Yeah. Like that. What was that? Not sure about the affine property. Yeah, so the affine property feels incorrect because these look quadratic. But notice that the affine is only in one variable at a time. Right, so it looks like linear plus a constant in T1 by itself, thinking of T2 and T3 as, as constants. Does that make sense? Okay, and then finally, F of T equals T cubed. What should be the blossom of that? I think you guys can probably pattern match by now. What do you, what do you think it's going to be? Somebody new. Yeah, there you go. Cool. Uh, well, I mean, I'm just going to go like the third times T1, T2, T3. That's very close. Does that satisfy the diagonal property? Uh, wait, like, but three times the same. I think it's bad. You're so close. Yes? That's right. So. Oh. Oh my goodness. Right? Like, notice essentially what we did is we just did like every possible pair, every possible triplet, every possible way to take one at a time and just average them together. Okay? And now what you can see is if you have any cubic polynomial, you can make its blossom by just combining these things. You can convince yourself of that at home. So here's an exercise that you should all do. You can post your answer on Piazza and discuss with one another. Is take the cubic blossom of this thing. I'm not going to do it on the board because I'm lazy and don't feel like writing. Okay. So hopefully I'll convince you Given any cubic function, you can compute a cubic blossom, right? Moreover, given any cubic blossom, notice that all of these things are at most degree three. So if I put t in three times, then I'll get back a cubic fun function, so I can go back and forth. And so, right, so this is how to blossom a cubic function. If I want to blossom a cubic curve, I'm going to use the same trick that we've been doing all along, which is to basically have a separate blossom for the x, y, and z components. That makes sense? Okay. So there are a bunch of different ways to obtain the blossom of a cubic curve. I mean, if you wanted to just do an algebra exercise, you would do what we did on the board, right? So every, for every cubic curve, you can just like, you know, work through some ugly calculation and fi figure out its blossom, and that's, that's fun. And when you go to trivia night at a bar, you can, you can do this really fast. You know, there's a bar in, in Somerville that has like spelling bee night, and I can never convince my friends to go, um, but in any event, probably the more important thing is that there are easier ways to specify cubic blossoms than that. In particular, so remember that if I have the blossom of a cubic curve, then that's really something whose x and y components are both just individually blossom functions. So if I want to specify the blossom of a cubic curve, I can actually do that by just specifying four things, which is big F of 0, 0, 0, big F of 0, 0, 1, big F of 0, 1, 1, and big F of 1, 1, 1. Notice that that's four pieces of information. And again, we have cubic curve, so implicitly we kind of know that that's going to be uh, give us our, our blossom. Okay? And it turns out, this is, this is where it's so cool, that geometrically a really, really beautiful thing happens. So in particular, we're going to have a spoiler alert. I'm going to draw you the picture, and then we're going to see how to actually get it. So here, uh, I've, I've dropped the little vector hat. I'm sorry, I was lazy. Um, I've drawn four points on the plane. 
these purple lines are imaginary. I just drew them because in my head they should be connected with. But, but really, like, there are just four points, right? And these are associated with the blossom of a cubic curve. So this is f of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and 1, 1, 1. And I've drawn for you in green the cubic curve that this corresponds to. <laughs> Notice that it like goes through these two points and that somehow these other two things are like controlling the shape. In fact, I think the user interface that we typically draw in like PowerPoint and so on just drops the line across the top. And then this will feel even more familiar for controlling points and their tangents. Um, and that's because actually uh, one thing you can convince yourself at home is if you compute the derivative like gamma prime, then it's actually the difference <laughs> scaled by three of the uh, pairs of, of, of control points here. So let's actually convince ourselves that we can get points along our curve from these four points from our cubic blossom. This is a cool algorithm. Does anybody know the name of this algorithm, by the way? Bonus points if you pronounce it correctly, because I actually don't know how to pronounce it correctly. So this is called the de castel algorithm, uh, and it looks like this. Okay. So I've got it on this, the board, so I'm going to try and do it on the board, and then we might have to abort midway. <laughs> and if we do, then we'll, we'll go onto the screen here. And this is, by the way, like every day from now until the end of the semester, you should like wake up in the morning, get out a piece of scrap paper, and like do like three subdivision curves just to like wake up. And guess what's going to be on your midterm? Okay. So let's say I have four points. By the way, we tend to draw these nice convex shapes. That's just because they're easy for professors to draw on the board. They could like they could cross each other. That's that's perfectly fine. Um, like that, okay? I'm gonna leave out the letter F here, and I'm just gonna label them 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, okay? Now, by the way, yes? What did you mean by they could cross each other? Oh, like I could draw um, that. It would be perfectly fine, but, but that's just annoying to draw, so <laughs> we're not gonna do that for now. Okay, so remember the symmetric property. Yeah, it says that I can permute the input to my blossom and it doesn't affect the point. So for instance, could somebody give me an alternative label for this point here? One, one, yeah, one, one, zero, or uh, one, zero, one. Right, and all of those will give me the same point by the symmetric property. Similarly for, for this guy over here, right? So just in general, it's actually perfectly fine to kind of keep them in sorted order or something because it doesn't really matter in our picture. Okay, so now let's derive the de castel joe algorithm. Now, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna mark the midpoint of every line segment like that. Now, let's take a look at this first line segment. Notice I drew a line segment here. We have 0, 0, 0 and 0, 0, 1. So these two guys have one, like two different coordinates that are in common and just a third one that's going from zero to one. By the affine property, what is the label of the point in the middle? I, like, I hear mumbling, which I think is the correct answer. Is somebody brave enough to speak up? Yes? Which is? What's one divided by two? Ah, you're killing me. This is zero, zero, one half. Okay? <laughs> by the affine property, which says that things look linear so long as I hold two of the coordinates constant and I only vary the third. Cool? So, notice that these two guys have a zero on the left and a one on the right, so they have two in common and then a third that varies. So what's going to be the label of this midpoint? That's right, zero, one half, one. Okay, and what's the label of this midpoint here? Notice, oh, I heard it and then I started talking, I'm sorry. One half, one, one, thank you. Ari, um, cool. So that's by the affine property. Okay. What do you think I'm gonna do now? I have three new points. I'm going to connect those guys with line segments too, okay? So I'm going to draw this line segment and that line segment. 
I took an engineering class in high school that told me if I should want to draw a straight line on the board, I should look at the target and then draw from the source. This seems to work okay. Okay, so let's divide these two guys in half. Okay, so notice we have 0, 0, 1 half and 0, 1 half 1. Yeah, but remember by the, the symmetric property, this is the same as 0, 1 half 0, right? So now we've got two coordinates are the same. And the third one is varying from 0 to 1. You guys get the pattern here? <laughs> What's going to be the label? 0, 1 half, 1 half. Can you see why I'm getting excited? This is such a cool algorithm. What's going to be the label of this point on the right? Notice that the, you know, it goes from 1 half, 1, 1. Right, exactly. Like that. Now what, I, what should I do? Draw another line segment. Like that. <laughs> okay? So I have 0, 1, half, 1, half. 1, half, 1, half, uh, 1, half, 1, 1. So when I divide this in half, Sorry, there's too many, too much mumbling. Does somebody want to raise their hand? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, good call. That should be one half, one half, one. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so the midpoint, notice that there's two one halves in common, and then the third one goes from zero to one. So this is one half, one half, one half, which as we know is f of one half by the diagonal property. So what did we do? We had f of 0, f of 1, and we got f of 1 half. This is called a subdivision technique, because it gave us a point kind of right in the middle of a curve. So let's draw that on the screen, because my board writing is ugly. So as a review, we took everything, we divided it in half, and that gave us these labels here, 0, 0, 1 half, 0, 1 half, 1, and 1 half, 1, 1. Now we can permute those labels any way that we want by the symmetric property. Now we drew more line segments, we divided it in half again, and then a third time. And so essentially, given f of 0 and f of 1, we now have f of 1 half, which is another point on our curve. And indeed, if I draw our curve, ta-da, it goes to that point. Yes? So if we draw a line segment from 0, 0, 1, 1, 1? From 0, 0, 0 to 1, yeah? The, the midpoint would be 1 half, 1 half, 1 half, right? No, that is a great question. So the question if I draw this line segment, like why can't I just say like that's f of 1 half? So that doesn't actually satisfy the affine property. The affine property says you can only change one of the three values at a time. <laughs> so here you slid all three from 0 to 1. But notice that like here I'm only changing the third one, for example. Yeah, great question. Otherwise this would just be like an affine function over the plane. Yes? Sure. So um, if we go back to our cubic blossom, remember that the cubic blossom is a function of three variables, t1, t2, and t3. So that's what these three values are. They're t1, t2, and t3. And essentially what I've labeled are f, this is really f of 0, 0, 0, like that. This is really f of 0, 0, 1, f of 0, 1, 1, and f of 1, 1, 1. So they're like four points on the plane. That's right. So these, so essentially, I think the better way maybe of thinking about it is those four points determine f. Yeah. Okay. So this algorithm is called the Castelgio algorithm. Does anybody else notice an interesting thing about this picture here? Notice if I kind of follow the points on the inside. Like I look at this point, this point, this point, and that point. That's actually the cubic control polygon for just the right half of this curve. And then similarly, the four points on the left are like the cubic control polygon for the left side of that curve. So if I wanted f of one quarter, I could follow exactly the same steps by now dividing these segments in half and, and continuing. Yeah, so this is an actually an, a recursive algorithm for getting more and more samples along our cubic curve. Uh, at home, you guys should draw like this thing and see if you can find f of one half just for exercise. Incidentally, it doesn't have to be one half. So I could also go like one quarter of the way and get f of one quarter if I wanted to. That's perfectly fine. I'm rushing because I see we're a little low on time. So essentially, what happened here? 
Given these four points on the plane, this kind of comes back to the question that we just got a minute ago, we can determine f of t for any value of t, um, just given those four points on the plane, by following this subdivision procedure. That's, that's the basic point here. And moreover, uh, if I want to, I can even make a recursive algorithm by like taking those inner points and, and repeating that whole thing. Yeah, and so this is a really nice way to specify and work with cubic curves, and it's a really easy algorithm, right? It's just like take two things, divide by two. As, you know, it's, it's basically just repeated averaging. Okay, so if we want to add a little bit more detail to our picture here, we can do that, of course. We can make our math a little more complicated. This topic is a little bit optional, but it's worth mentioning. But there is another basis for cubic polynomials called the Bernstein basis. And the basic point here is that I can specify a cubic by those four points, right, those f of 0, 0, f of 0, 0, 1, f of 0, 1, 1, and f of 1, 1, 1, scaled by the Bernstein polynomials, and then that gives me f of t at any t. Okay, so this is just basically codifying this algorithm um, in, in a set of, of polynomials. In fact, uh, if you're really good, you can use the de castle joe algorithm, but instead of 1 half, put like a t here, and then you'll, you can work out the expression for f of t based on these four points. It's going to be kind of ugly but you'll see that it ends up being exactly that, that Bernstein basis. I can do that during office hours if you guys want. Yes, Ari. Um, sorry, I think I'm a little bit confused. Um, these cubic blossoms kind of are separate on their own. What stops like one cubic blossom from being 0, 0, 0, and another from being like 4, 4, 4, which is that case like all three numbers are different and you can't do um, the subdivision? So the cubic blossom is really defined for one cubic function at a time. Oh. And so there's really just three separate ones, one for the x-coordinate, one for the y-coordinate, and then if you're in 3D, one for the z-coordinate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes? So in your response to their question, you said that indeed these could be any four points on the plane, but are the actual values restricted to zeros and ones? So we're interested in having, right. Like, 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 ah, that's a great question. Here's a, here's a challenge for you to do in your scrap paper. Given these four points, can you find f of 2? The answer is yes, you can kind of formally follow these things, but now you're going to have to kind of extrapolate these line segments beyond their ends here. But it actually will end up be doing kind of a cool thing. It's kind of like uh, starting with this, uh, what a, mm, 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 uh, that's okay. Like starting with these four points and then constructing the larger polygon outside of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh huh. That's a good question. Yeah, that's by convention. So the question was like, do we only ever care about t values between 0 and 1? The answer is no. I mean, like cubic polynomials, you can evaluate for any t. That's perfectly fine. I think typically these artistic tools do just draw it between 0 and 1 because that's where this algorithm applies. Um, or at least the, this algorithm is the most tangible. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's like a convention that you choose in your software. Like you could make it 0 to pi or something if you wanted, but um, you probably wouldn't. In fact, um, if you want to sound very fancy, so eventually we'll talk a little bit in this class about something called non-NURBS surfaces, which is non-uniform oh, ah, non rational B-splines, <laughs> where what we're going to do is we're going to glue together multiple of these curves, and we're going to choose maybe different T-ranges for different ones, because that turns out to uh, let you have a little more control over the geometry. Yeah. Uh-huh. Any other uh, questions? I know this stuff is hard to wrap your head around the first time. But the good news is that at the end of the day, what did we do? We divide it in half, drew line segments, divide in half, draw line segment, divide in half, and you're done. That's the cool algorithm. It's backed up by a bunch of algebra. Okay. So, right, so the Bernstein basis is just the basis that is kind of reflected in this, this procedure here. And what could I do to go between the monomial basis and the Bernstein basis? Just use a matrix, just like anything else, right? And so, in particular, there's some matrix that I can read off of my formulas for the Bernstein polynomials. And it looks a little something like this, right? So given the monomials down here, this matrix gives me the b's on, on the left-hand side. And this is just like a slick way of writing those four functions on the top. If I invert this function, by the way, I can now uh, get back from the monomials to, uh, or sorry, get back to the monomials from the Bernstein basis, if you wanted to do that. I think this is pretty rare, but... I thought in the slides I might as well give you every possible matrix and its inverse just for, for fun. Okay, so to summarize what we've done so far, essentially we have three different bases for cubic curves and they're useful for different things. Do you see that? 
So like the monomial basis is somehow useful for nothing, but like it's the one that you all learn in algebra class, so that's where we start. But then we have these other two, Ermit and Bernstein, and the reason that we might use them is that they make different computational tasks simpler, right? So given the Ermit basis, if I have two points and two tangents, then I can just read off the cubic curve that goes through them by linearly combining the Ermit functions. And if instead I have those four cubic control polygon points, then by linearly combining the Bernstein basis, I can get the same cubic curve. There's a really key point that I think sometimes gets lost in discussions like this. Is there any curve that I can write in one of these bases that I cannot write in another? How many of us vote yes? How many of us vote no? How many of us are like, I am not going to raise my hand for hell or high water? Yeah, a few. Yeah, yeah. so the answer is, 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 is no. That, like, these are all just different bases for the same set of stuff. Right? They're just different ways to express cubic polynomials. They're just convenient for different types of computation. But they're somehow not more expressive. Right? All of them can draw the same set of curves, which is cubic stuff. So what does that mean? That means, for instance, if I had like, the cubic control points for the Bernstein basis, I could find the Hermite coefficients by doing like, matrix vector product kind of stuff, right? and vice versa. Yes, question. Yeah, sure. So to repeat, monomial basis is useful just for like algebra stuff. Hermite basis is useful for given two points and given two tangents. Find me the curve through those two points and those two tangents. And the Bernstein basis is useful for given four points, those cubic control points. Find me the curve that kind of ins is inside of those four. Okay. Now, if we want to make our math notation even slicker, that's just like our goal in our everyday life, we can do that. So remember that I told you we can kind of write any of our cubic bases as like a matrix times the monomials. I can now put the geometry matrix on the left-hand side, which is like how we're going to combine this basis to get our x and y coordinate functions. And you'll see that that gets factored on the left. And this provides a really slick way of expressing a, a cubic curve, right? So essentially here we have our spline matrix. So like this is the Bernstein basis matrix. I could have put in that Hermit one instead. And then on the, on the left-hand side, we have the geometry matrix, which is like the control points, or the two points and the two tangents. So in general, this is just a nice notation, which is pretty standard in this, uh, this little community, which is to kind of factor your, your function gamma of t as a geometry matrix, which is the thing that's specifying like control points or the shape, times the basis matrix, which is the thing that's like expressing what basis we're using, times monomials, because those are convenient. <laughs> OK. And, and that's the basic picture here. Now, next time, we'll talk about surfaces. And we'll have one slide to suggest what this looks like for surfaces. And, and, and in short, it's, it's kind of ugly. You end up with like tensors and stuff. And that doesn't matter. But, but for curves, it's, it's quite elegant. So as a quick review here, essentially, we've just done a bunch of four-dimensional linear algebra. Do you guys see that? Like This class, I think, does linear algebra in the most annoying fashion possible in the very first technical lecture. Later on, we're going to do the more kind of tangible stuff when we talk about like camera transformations. So this is actually, to me, some of the hardest math we do in this course. It's right at the beginning. Um, just too bad. But essentially, all we did was this four-dimensional algebra. And we defined three different bases and showed that like, a basis isn't just like an exercise that makes linear algebra students have a headache. It's actually useful. And different bases are useful for different tasks. By the way, we didn't ever use a dot product. It's actually not clear what dot products mean in this space. We're, but, so like, there's no notion of orthogonality here yet. But um, that's OK. These are just different ways to express cubic things. To give a quick preview for next time, um, here's going to be an annoyance. So like, we had cubic polynomials to go through four points, or like two points and two tangents, or whatever. Maybe I start raising the degree of my polynomial to go through more and more points. That turns out to be a terrible idea. You can get really bad artifacts when you do that. So instead of doing that, we're going to kind of glue together lots of low degree polynomials and just do a very careful calculation to make sure they glue in a clean way. Um, with the philosophy being that, of course, one cubic isn't enough. So here's like my favorite figure in any math textbook. Um, and I, I challenge you to come up with a single polynomial curve that approximates this. I think it would be quite difficult. By the way, this figure is, is drawn to illustrate the, um, I think it's the Jordan curve theorem. Do you guys know this one? Jordan curve theorem is closed curves have insides. It's one of these facts from topology that sounds like totally empty and boring. And their point is it's actually very hard. Like if I just mark a point in this picture, to, can you tell me really quickly, is that on the inside or the outside? It's on the inside. <laughs> it's actually like, kind of annoying. It is, it's pretty funny that they were, had to work pretty hard to find an example where it's not obvious. 
this is true. And this is roughly how you prove that theorem. OK, and so when we glue stuff together, that's going to be called a spline. So anyway, that's our, our recap for the day. With that, we will see you on Thursday. I hope I haven't scared you all out with lots of math. Um, don't forget to work on your assignment, and we'll see you next time. All right. One moment. Oh.